Episode 75, Explorer, Adventurer, Reality Television Host, Ed Stafford. Welcome to The Art of Excellence, a show about people doing extraordinary things in their lives. I'm your host, Glenn Zweig. Thanks for joining me. My guest today is Ed Stafford. Ed is a British explorer. He holds the Guinness World Record for being the first person to walk the length of the Amazon River. He has been one of the National Geographic Adventures of the Year and was also the European Adventure of the Year. He's written multiple books on his quests, and now hosts an adventure reality show on Discovery Channel called Ed Stafford, First Man Out. Ed, welcome to the show. That's great. Thank you for inviting me on. Now, I think you're on the verge of starting another season. Is it uh, the Ed Stafford, First Man Out? It is. Um, not the Ed Stafford, First Man Out, but... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> just, Ed, just Ed Stafford. Yeah. But to, to, to my friends, I just I let them call me Ed rather than the Ed Stafford. Um, I just don't want to be too formal, you know? Gotcha, gotcha. Well, you know, some people know about it. Some people won't. You're essentially uh, dropped in some remote part of the world, and you've got to compete with another survival expert to complete some really challenging trek. So ever any real danger to you on those, or are there people looking after you? And if you had to sort of press the escape button, you're, you're all good. Yeah, to be honest, it's the latter. Um, I'd, I'd love to say that, you know, I'm, I'm in a genuinely life-threatening situation the whole time, but it's just not the truth. I think what I'm proud of in the show is that basically we, 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 there's parameters within which you can have an adventure, you know, and we're in, within which you can survive. But of course, it's a construct. You know, we go into a country and, you know, there's ex-special forces guys who come in before us who've got lots of gnarly experience and they and they provide a, a route for you, I, I suppose, a arena in which you can have a, a survival experience that is filmable, I suppose, and that's got interesting elements to it, whether that be that you can't find any water or you can't find any food or that there's a particularly abundant source of um source of something um and and basically you then have a, a, an adventure within that and let's face it if anything went wrong you would just get the satellite phone out and call somebody and somebody would be in to whip you out in about five minutes i would have thought i watched some clips of this and these survival skills you have are these just things you pick up on the fly or have you learned them over the years so like as an example there was an episode where you created some kind of the best way I can describe it is like an intricate trap using stones. Uh, and then uh, the meat of a dead bird is bait on a stick between these stones. And then you would catch a rat, <laughs> which, which you ate for breakfast. And yeah. you, you know, even if I had the producers in the show say, all right, Glenn, what you want to do is basically go create a, a, a rat trap using a, <laughs> find a dead, uh, you know, animal and, and take it and, and put a sip between these rocks. I, I'd have no clue what to do. Like, did you know how to do that or did they set that up for you? No, I mean, I, I don't want to sort of, although I say, you know, the, the, the adventures within a certain parameters, it's not, it's not a scripted show. You know, you do do whatever you need to do in order to feed yourself in order to survive. And therefore... Yeah, I've a certain amount of knowledge. I think I've built it up over the years. Um, since walking the Amazon, which was an expedition that I did without any survival skills at, at all, I've obviously entered this world of television survival. And, and, and initially, I was definitely making it up as I went along. You know, I didn't have the skills. And I think that's actually why it was more exciting. I did a 60-day project to be put on a, alone on a desert island. And one of the reasons it made really good telly is that I really struggled. You know, I really it took 13 days to get a fire going, you know, and, and, and I and I struggled mentally as well. And I think I think the audience related to that because it was so real. Um, subsequently, you know, I've done 10 series, I think, for Discovery now. Invariably, you pick stuff up as you go along, don't you? And we were really lucky with the initial series of Maroons. We'd get about Marooned was um, was was the first survival show that I did after that 60 day experiment. And we'd get two or three days with indigenous guys and they would go, you know, don't whatever you do, eat this or don't whatever you do, touch this animal or don't whatever you or, or this is a really good source of materials for thatching. And 
and I would obviously glean all of this information and there would be loads of new content for the shows, which is amazing when, when they actually, you know, press go and, and I actually was then let loose into this environment and had to survive. I had new content, but it means over the years I've just built it up as well. And I've started doing these online bushcraft courses as well, which is, which is great, which is again, reinforced. I, I was never a, an outdoor instructor. I, I'm ex-military and, and, and in terms of the survival stuff, I'd always yeah, exactly gleaned it off indigenous people mostly and then and then now teaching it reinforces it in your own brain doesn't it so i do that now consider myself quite knowledgeable on the subject well, well let me give another example so there's this episode where you had to eat so you decided to kill a goat not because you wanted to kill an animal but you sort of had to to survive so you kill this goat but that's not where you stop and so you then figured out how to use its coat as a layer of clothing to protect yourself because you were way up high and it was really frigid yeah. temperatures. Um, and, and so just being able to cut off the hide cleanly in one piece in and of itself was pretty impressive. And then you knew it was safe and healthy to eat its brain raw, which you did. And then, and here's the part I love, you saved part of the brain, Ed, because you had to moisturize the hide. Because if you didn't moisturize it, then the hide from the go <laughs> would have turned stiff and then it wouldn't have been very effective as an insulating layer. And then of course, naturally you also knew to smoke the meat so you could cure it. So you carry it along as jerky snacks along the way. Like all the, I would have, <laughs> I would have gotten like not even 1%. I mean, you made full use of that go. You even dried out the intestines to use as cord for other things. So w once again, w was that already in your toolkit or were there like, people on the sidelines whispering like, oh, hey, Ed, here's what you should do next and then do this. You just somehow knew, here's what you do with a goat <laughs> after you kill it. I, I, I've done it before, is, is, is the honest truth. And therefore, you learn, you learn by your mistakes. And, and um, the, first, uh, the first goat that I killed was, um, was on the 60-day experience, and, and it was the first large animal I'd ever killed. I'd, I'd never killed anything bigger than a rabbit before that. Um, and it's quite distressing, actually. And, and, and you know, I, I'm not, again, I'm not one for killing things unnecessarily, but, uh, but I'm a meat eater, you know, and therefore I, I do believe that if you, if you eat meat, you should be prepared to think about the actual life itself. And, the, and, and if you're able to actually, um, you know, take part in that, the killing of the animal, then I think that's a healthy thing because it, it reminds you that it is, that it is something to um, appreciate, I suppose. But yeah, I, I think again, if you're going to kill something, then use every little bit of it. And, and in those scenarios, you know, I have made, um, you know, to cover those points, I have, I've made hides before that have ended up being completely useless because they've gone so stiff like cardboard that I couldn't use it for anything, you know? And therefore you, you, you then, you know, invariably either speak to somebody or look it up and go, well, okay, well, how am I going to make this? How am I going to make this in a short period of time? Because obviously there's loads of, there's loads of um, this sort of bushcraft or, or, or primitive technology stuff it takes ages and I've never really gotten very much time. What can you do to soften the hide and keep it soft in the short term? And, and the brains is, is a really good thing. And it's, it's literally like, um, it's not like polish, but you know, you've got, you get the sort of um, cream sometimes for, for leather, for shoes that, you, that comes in a little tub. And it just felt like cream. It was the most amazing thing, just using the brains and working it into the leather and you could feel it was doing the leather good um, and, and making it supple. And, and yeah, I, I suppose to, generically answer your question I, I, I've picked it up as I've gone along but it's then a really nice knowledge to have I mean I I used to take the mickey out of um out of people who could you know light fire with two sticks and think you know it's it's not realistic you'd never be in that situation and I, and I used to be quite dismissive of it but having now had to learn it for the tv shows it's really freeing it's really liberating to walk into a woods and go Do you know what I've got the confidence to know that, that I could make fire if I needed to and suddenly you're not as reliant on physical things. I'm not as reliant on a knife anymore, even then. You know, I've done 180 days for Discovery Channel now um, without even a knife. Um, and the present series does include a knife, thankfully, because it makes things a lot faster. But but um, that's quite freeing as well. So, you know, you, you literally have more confidence going out into the world. And I think in, in this world of COVID and lockdowns and, 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 and people spending too much time indoors, having those skills is, is very liberating. Well... You know, to understand Ed the adventurer, you, you sort of got to rewind the clock and understand Ed as a child. And it sounds like, uh, you know, your father, I know not your biological father, but the father who raised you, uh, had a very big influence on shaping your character. He taught you that if you're going 
to do something, you should do it and not give up until you've given it your all. So, Ed, doing what you say and not giving up definitely speaks to integrity. Uh, it speaks to tenacity, but not necessarily the ambition part. So help me understand that element of your character. Was that part of your dad's influence too, or how, where did that come from? No, I, I think he, yeah, the thing that I got from him was, as you said, you know, if you say you're going to do something, you have to fulfill on that because nobody likes a flaky um, human being. You know, it's the, there are, I have friends that, you know, they say they'll do something and you kind of know that they won't. And you're less respectful, I think, of them. And they're, they're, they're not as much of a complete version of themselves because you just love it if they if they would take responsibility for what they're committing to. Um, I think the ambition came from insecurity, if you want the real um, real truth. I definitely, um, I was adopted. And, um, and as, a, 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 as a baby, um, I had to adapt in order to, you know, I, I think one of the survival techniques of, of adopted children is that, you know, they, they have a huge insecurity when they, they adapt their behavior in order to make people like them, essentially, is the, mm. is the long truth of it. And also, they end up de- devising their sense of self through um, a sort of reflected sense of self in other people. So if you walk into a room and you tell a joke and people uh, laugh at it, then you know you're funny. Um, and equally, if you walk the length of the Amazon and everyone says you're really tough, then then you know you're really tough. And I think that was the level at which I was insecure. I really needed to beat my chest on such a big stage because because I was I didn't even know who I was. I didn't I I doubted my own capabilities. For, for some reason, I mean, this is this is quite personal, but I even thought I was infertile because I was adopted. I, it's stuff that isn't logical, but um, mm-hmm. but manifests as a sort of in, as a sort of long term sort of chronic insecurity. And and I needed to do I needed to prove to myself definitely that I was capable, but I also needed to um, weirdly I needed to prove it on a bigger scale, a bigger stage than that as well. You know, I you know I didn't have to get a book deal. I didn't have to you know put it on Discovery Channel, but but it was. For some reason, that was necessary for me, and and I, I think it's weird. It, there was definitely an element of ego in that. I think you know, young men are far more worried about what other people think of them than older middle-aged men, uh, as we all all get a bit more ugly and a bit more wise. Um, and I think weirdly, it, it ended up changing into it. Although it was all about you know proving myself and and, and being tough and, and and being strong and, and and doing that on a big stage initially, I think. It's now evolved into a into a really really nice job where I still am able to provide for my family, but but it's actually quite humbling as well. I keep getting thrown into situations where I haven't got a clue what how to solve this problem, and then therefore you keep com- being humbled, coming having to come up with new solutions, and therefore you keep learning as well. So it's it's sort of come full circle, and and um, and I still love what I do, but it's but I think it's genuinely still a, a good thing for me as well. Yeah, well, well the scouts was also a pretty formative experience for you. Mm. Was that about camping and hiking and sort of soaking up the outdoors? As Was there something else in terms of, you know, the Scouts is also, there's a lot of structure and, and gaining recognition, gaining medals, you know, advancing, moving up. Mm. What was the part of it that you really took to? I think it was the affinity with the outdoors. Uh, I think it helped to reinforce that. I, I grew up in the countryside. We were building dams and dens and tree houses and all of that sort of things. And the scouts put a, a skill set on top of that. So um, suddenly I could administrate myself living out of a rucksack. Suddenly I could put up a tent, navigate, all that sort of stuff, you know, and, and tie knots. Um, and I think for me, again, it was... It, it enabled me to be more confident in an environment that felt safe in. People were scary um, when I grew up. I was quite a shy kid. Um, I, I I wasn't shy in my village because it was, you know, I knew them all. I knew all the other kids and we'd, we'd play in the fields and it was ace. But in a school environment, I became quite withdrawn and quite shy. And I think, the, for me, the Scouts represented immersing myself in, in the outdoors, which was my comfort zone. Um, it, it helped reinforce that sort of... Um, connection with nature i suppose yeah well, well speaking of school your parents would send you to boarding school which uh, didn't seem to suit you too well you became uh, rebellious and were actually expelled from school all right ed what what the heck did you do to be expelled from school i chopped down a tree that the queen planted actually um wait are you serious yeah yeah no i did <laughs> uh, basically the, it was quite a posh school um and um 
my parents weren't ridiculously wealthy, but they're both um, lawyers. They were both solicitors and um, we were in the red most of the time I was growing up so that they could afford the, the school fees. And so it was a bit of a slap in the face to them that I got expelled. But basically, I just got bored of boarding school. You know, I, I think I had this big drive in me to to do adventurous things. And, and that came out as naughtiness, essentially. That came out as disruptiveness because there was no channel for this sort of this energy. The teachers didn't know really what to do with me. And so I ended up sneaking out of the boarding house and literally wearing balaclava and all of this sort of malarkey. And the Queen had come and visited the school on the 200th anniversary of the school. So it's the bicentenary year of the school. And we were still in black for mourning Queen Victoria's death for some reason. We still wore the complete black. <laughs> and um, anyway, snuck out in the middle of the night, decided it would be a good idea to chop this tree down, replanted it in the middle of the house master's lawn. And um, the following day was a charity day, which in England we call Red Nose Day. And uh, normally people get dressed up in fancy dress and they raise lots of money for charity. And the headmaster... The, mor- that mor- the following morning, went on stage with this tree and said, look, if whoever chopped this tree down doesn't own up by break time, we're going to cancel the whole of Red Nose Day. And they did. I didn't own up. And they cancelled the whole of Red Nose Day and they lost about £40,000 worth of charity money. Um, and so when I eventually was found out, they just went, right, get out. Get out. Goodbye. You're gone. Yeah. I'm surprised you didn't own up to it because you wanted to leave anyway. I think I think you know. Looking back on it, I wanted. Looking back on it, I wanted to leave anyway. But I think you know, as yeah. a child, invariably, that's quite a scary thing, isn't it? Yeah. Well, well, I know you know you go on to college, and then following college, you decided to join the British Army. So, Ed, I'm I'm trying to reconcile this, you know, sort of rebellious f the rules part of you, from even though I get that you like the scouts because of the outdoors and all that, it's still a fairly structured place. And then the army, of course, a lot of structure, a lot of discipline, follow the rules. Help me reconcile these two. I think it was because it represented a structure. Um, I think I was still a little bit lost. I hadn't really found myself. And, um, and yes, on the face of it, it, you get to roll around in the mud and it's all exciting and you get to travel and that sort of stuff. And I use that as an excuse, but I think actually it was the structure. Um, when I did the 60 days on an island on my own, I, I even had to break the day down into specific parts. And I was like, OK, I'm going to get up and I'm going to make a lemon leaf tea and then I'm going to go to work and then I'm going to build my shelter and then I'm going to take a five minute break. And it, it was ridiculous how rigid I was. And and I think that's why I joined the military as well. It, it, it it allowed me to relax because I was doing what I was meant to be doing, you know, go here, do this. And, 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 and at a time when I didn't have much direction in my life, I think I needed that, that structure around me. And, you know, if, if your meals are cooked for you and you, you get allocated your job, you know, that, that gives you a bit of a purpose in life, doesn't it? And um, I also wasn't completely unaware of the fact it was equipping me with more skills, you know, the leadership and management training that you get coming out of the Royal Military Academy, sand test is, is second to none you know we, we used to come on this competition to west point and, and take part in a competition called the uh, the sandhurst cup and i remember while i was there we'd we'd won it and we, i think we had about 10 percent of the population of west point at sandhurst so we were tiny and we were very proud of the fact we'd won that competition for 15 years in a row um so you know it, 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 I, I was very happy that i was throwing myself into um this rigorous training that that that, that was a high level but did I ever really um, embrace the military? No, I don't think I did. You know, a lot of people were counting the days down until they finished training. And I was actually, during training, counting the days down until I could leave the army. Um, right. Because... Uh, you, you were looking for another tree to chop. <laughs> well, let's talk about this quest to hike the Amazon. And we're talking hiking the entire length of the Amazon. Nobody had ever done it before. And... Well, there was a broader mission to the journey around raising awareness for deforestation. The primary motivations, and these are your words, were more selfish, which was the adventure of it, the challenge, and the recognition. So I, I want to talk a bit about the recognition piece. I get the challenge, the adventure. Is this longing for extrinsic validation? Is that sort of back to the insecurity that you know, needing others to recognize what you're capable of doing? Definitely. I, I think um, to, to unpack the adoption thing, I think a little bit more. 
in order to win people over, in order to find people in the world that love you, you adapt your own behavior. And so there is this concept that adopted kids actually lose a sense of who they are. Um, so they end up doing everything in life in order to please other people, to get this positive response um, and, and uh, to be loved. And, and, and then they lose sight of who they are. So they never end up doing things. They end up in relationships that don't make them happy. They end up choosing jobs that their dad might want them to do um, that, that, that isn't really what they want to do. And um, and so I, I, I do think there was there was an element to which walking the Amazon um, – I was still trying to um, get a reaction from from a big audience. You know, I, I was trying to, I, w- I was looking for that. You know, quirky this guy isn't he super tough? How can anyone walk the Amazon? Isn't that amazing? How how tough he was? And and it, and I think it's only going through something like that and coming out the other side and realizing that you're still the same human being. You, nothing's changed. Um, you're not suddenly um, some demigod now that you've walked the amazon you're still going home to the same parents and you, you've still got the same sort of um thought processes and, and habits and everything like that and 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 but and yet i did think that weirdly i think for reasons that i didn't understand it it started a bit of an evolution for me a personal evolution i i, I remember describing having sort of battles going on in my brain um and it, I didn't understand psychology at all um, when I was a young man. You know, if I had any problems, I'd, I'd just probably reach for the nearest beer and and, and get drunk, um, like you know a lot of military people do. Um, but I started to become more self-aware because of the fact that I was making the expedition quite hard for myself. I was tying myself in knots. I was getting um, aggressive um, because things were seemingly in my head standing in the way of getting to the end and so I was intolerant and I was impatient and I was somewhat selfish in the way I treated people I think for the Amazon but I think putting yourself through those sort of things does make you more self-aware and 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 I think you know you learn from from being humbled that you can't treat people in certain ways and then things come back and and and, and hit you in the face um and so I think, you know, I, I did invariably, I know it was just the start of a, of a can of worms that needed to be unpacked. But I think it was a, a journey of um, the beginning of a journey of self-discovery for me as well. Yeah. Yeah. Well, when you first conceived the adventure, you had calculated that to hike this, I think, 4,345 miles in one year, you would just need to manage 11 miles a day, which seems you know pretty doable. But uh, apparently your calculations were off just a bit. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that was that was how long I wanted to give to a daft adventure like this was was a year. So I just literally divided 4,000 miles, which is the same distance from the center of the earth to the surface of the earth, divided that by 365 days and came up with 11 miles a day. And, and yeah, I averaged four miles a day. So it took two and a half years to complete the whole thing, um, which sounds like a lot. But again, if you if you refer back to the the, the sort of military jobs that I'd had you know you might do a two-year posting to Afghanistan or you might do a two-year posting to Germany or something like that so essentially it was just a two years and four months posting and at the end of that you know I went in at a sort of lieutenant or lieutenant as you guys call it level and and, and came out as a you know a major or a colonel or something like that I, I got promoted and, and so it was a it was a beneficial thing and, and yes there was definitely a an element of putting my life on pause to do it um, into well, the conventional sort of out, uh, exterior life, like love life and family and stuff like that. Yeah. Well, it, it was, I mean, it was definitely pretty tough, you know, making a lot of progress. And I want to provide a quote here just to provide some context to this, because it's not exactly like you're doing this leisurely walk through a groom hiking path here. So here's the quote. Imagine the thickest of bramble bushes knotted with razor-sharp vines and spiky palms. Then imagine sinking the whole thing in a swimming pool full of muddy water and having to make your way through that swimming pool using just an 18-inch machete. <laughs> so, I mean, it definitely doesn't sound like for the faint of heart. And, and by the way, this is doing all that while you're carrying a 70-pound backpack. So, I, I mean, I'm surprised you're even making four miles a day. It seems like I'd make it like 50 feet. I think it depended on the Amazon is so varied in terms of the terrain. Um, some of the days when we were in floodwaters um, and, you know, the, the Amazon River, when when it's in flood season, it spills out. The banks are very indistinct. It sp- spills out into flooded forest or what they call Vazea forest. And 
up to about 80, 90 kilometers away from the river. So, you know, 50, 60 miles away from the river is, is still essentially this body of water that's, that's going through the trees. And, um, and so, yeah, at, at times you were, you weren't just hacking through the jungle, you were doing it underwater uh, and it was ridiculous. So, you know, and then we got above neck height, then we've got these inflatable pack rafts, um, alpaca rafts, and, and we'd kneel in the front of them and, and, and carry on hacking. <laughs> um, but it was, um, yeah, it, it was an utterly ridiculous concept, the whole expedition. You know, why would you walk the Amazon? The whole place is set up for for boat navigation. You know, that's how <laughs> everybody gets around. And and um, every village we'd walk into, um, the villagers would say, you're, you're crazy. You can't walk to the next village. You have to go by boat. And we go, no, we're not crazy. We're, we'll be fine. Okay, okay. Well, wait a minute here. <laughs> okay, you kept a diary. So this was one of your diary entries. I mean, like, I think six weeks or eight weeks into this two-year journey. Okay, here it goes. Okay. I now think it's possible I will die on this trip, but I am so committed and focused on finishing that I think it's a risk worth taking. We've been lucky so far. I feel that my life is in the hands of fate. So, Ed, I, I completely, again, get the pursuit of something substantial, but you were really willing to risk your life over it? It was that important? It was. Um, I think, again, if you, if you do grow up somewhat of a grey man, you know, and, 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 you know, okay, I was, I was a half-decent army officer, but I wasn't a great one, and I hadn't really come into my own. And, and then suddenly I, I latched onto something that, one, I was good at, two, I kind of felt that this was defining for me and that, that, that I didn't have a significant other that was waiting at home or children or dependents or anything like that i had a mum yeah okay but everyone has a mum and and i really felt that do you know what this i am i am prepared to give my life to this i am prepared and 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 you know definitely there were times when we did risk assessments and the the outcome was unacceptable and you know my um walking partner cho and i would giggle and just do it anyway and, and we had this little saying between us um uh, Si morimos, morimos, which was if we die, we die. And and and, it, and I don't think it was because we had a death wish at all. It wasn't that we wanted to die, but it was, there's no point focusing on, and, and, and in society, we get so wrapped up in fear of death, don't we? And we wanted to have an adventure and everyone, I think, was annoying us by telling us that we were going to die. Everyone thought we were going to die. And and it just became annoying after a while. And so we, we just were like, Look, if we die, we die, it's fine. And we weren't actually being flippant we just recognized the folly in focusing on that all the time, I think. Yeah. The uh, diary entry would prove somewhat prescient because at one pretty harrowing part of the trip, you uh, and your uh, hiking partner, uh, I think had just banked and you looked up river and saw that there were five dugout canoes full of armed tribesmen pointing guns and arrows right at you. And you just sort of froze. They quickly caught up to you, jumped out of their canoes and came up to you face to face, which my God must have gotten your heart pounding. So what, uh, what was that all about? What happened next? How did you even handle that situation? Well, I think, I mean, that, that, that's one of the reasons I ended up wanting to walk the Amazon rather than kayak it because I'd read, um, there's an amazing book called Running the Amazon, which is written by an American journalist from New York, I think, called Joe Kane. And he, he ran the Amazon with a Czech called Piotr Hemilinski. And they described lots of encounters with indigenous people, but they were on the river sailing past really fast and getting these little arrows splashing in the water around them, which I thought was extraordinary. And, you know, wow, what an incredible thing to go through these wild tribal areas. But they had fleeting experiences with the tribes, you know, and I just thought, wouldn't it be far far more an intense thing if you had to look into the eyes of each one of these uh, tribal chiefs and convince them that you're not a threat and you're not a bad person and and um crikey i got more than i bargained for <laughs> really. <laughs> yeah just slightly <laughs> but yeah no, no, that incident yeah they they threatened to kill a white person there was, there's an hf radio system in in peru and I, we'd radio down river to let them know that we were we were intending to come through and this village had reported back on the radio that if a white person comes through we'll kill him immediately and so cho who's my walking partner um came up with this concept of we've got these inflatable pack rafts we paddled out to this 
two kilometer or yeah, mile and a half long sandbank or shingle island in the middle of the river. We were just going to skip around their community by by being on the island in the middle of the river. But um, clearly, we got to the downstream end. <laughs> Uh, Cho said they'd look behind you and the, these dugout canoes were, were heading towards us at high speed. And I thought that they were from the community that had given us the death threat, but they weren't. But there's no way of really telling that. And so, yeah, we we thought we were goners, to be honest. We literally thought they were coming to the island to kill us. And, you know, the men were scary enough with their guns, but it was the women that had the machetes because they didn't have guns because they weren't hunters. And they were terrifying and you know these guys have lived through lots of bloodshed as well so they've lived through the time of the shining path the communist guerrillas so it's not that they haven't fought back they have they fought against the shining path because the former president fujimori armed the indigenous guys and they fought hard back against the shining path so it was not outside the realms of uh, impossibility that they would have attacked us and hacked us to pieces they didn't obviously and i i, I just had this inherent feeling that if we walked through and we weren't a threat i wasn't a threat to anyone um and you know i was essentially a tourist going through some quite hairy areas but i was just a hapless tourist and i just trusted i think my sort of faith in human kindness that if i i, I definitely never wanted to be armed i'd been in afghanistan before and, and we, we were in an unarmed united nations role and a couple of my mates had armed themselves and got stopped in a, in a in an illegal checkpoint and got themselves killed because it escalated the violence. And so I was determined that I wasn't going to escalate anything. And it was just a case of, I think, the nuances of literally reading people's faces. And, and, and you know, you couldn't smile in that situation because it would have been offensive. You, but, but equally, you couldn't look nervous in that situation because, because you wanted to show a certain amount of strong, respectful, I don't know, understanding. And, and, and so the... The, the nuances of, of reading the situation and, and in that situation the, the tribal chief and his brother were, were drunk when they when they came out across the river and so another factor layered onto the whole thing is that they're not really in their right minds and I'm trying to show them a permit from the police force of Peru and they can't even read you know there's only three people in the village who can speak Spanish the rest of them speak indigenous language I mean there's so many layers of complications of getting through but in the end they they, they took us back to their village and you know we were under sort of arrow point the whole time and it was only when they were going through my bag and, and pulling out satellite phones and solar panels and all this stuff that they became so fascinated in what I was carrying in my bag that I think they kind of calmed down and forgot to be angry in a weird way um we ended up that was it was quite a beautiful story actually because that uh, the tribal chief who was called Andreas and his brother Alfonso in the whole expedition the two people that I was the most scared of in any incident because it was quite a quite a big day um and yet they both agreed to walk with us as guides and I thought they'd walk with us for a couple of days um and they walked with us for 47 days and became incredibly good friends. And so every time we went into a village, rather than people being suspicious, Alfonso and Andreas would just say, no, no these are our great friends from um, from England. And and um, and they'd throw a party and we'd get pissed on um, really cheap jungle liquor rather than being treated with suspicion. So I, it was just such an extraordinary roller coaster of a ride. It really was. Yeah. For our American listeners, that's pissed as in drunk, not pissed as in. <laughs> okay, just want to clarify there. So, you know, when there's not angry tribesmen, you know, coming right at you, of course, uh, there's venomous snakes, there's jaguars, there's caiman in the waters. But it, it sounds like almost worse than the predators were the mosquitoes and the ants. And it, at what point, I think you said you were like bitten like thousands of times a day by these mosquitoes. Yeah. And then one time you were hiking and you inadvertently knocked down an ant's nest, which landed on your backpack. And then thousands and thousands were just crawling all over your body. And you had to strip down and remove them one by one. So I, I, it sounds like a lot of fun, Ed. And the ants, the mosquitoes, the tribesmen, all the predators, did all of the danger, did that add appeal for you? You know, because it makes finishing all the more noteworthy, like, oh, yeah, climbing the mountains all the better when, you know, we almost died. Was, was that part of it? You're hitting on quite a few things here. The, the hard thing was the monotony. The hard thing was the monotony combined with the frustrations of the ants and the bee stings and the wasp stings and the mosquito stings. That was actually what made the trip difficult, I think. What made it 
bearable and sellable, I suppose, from a book perspective and a and a and a TV perspective, was the life threatening moments, and that actually it made it more interesting as well because that's when you kick kick into survival mode, your adrenaline starts pumping, and suddenly you've got to deal with the situation in front of you. And, and I'm not really an adrenaline junkie just for the sake of it. Actually, um, I know it, it might appear like I am on the on the, on the face of it, but. But but those those moments are you know they're, they're they're etched in your memory for the rest of your life. But I don't think they were the thing that made it difficult was the um, was was the monotony and and trying to stay motivated, trying to trying to stay positive when you're again you are putting on damp clothes every morning. And, and I had little mental blocks that I had to get over, like putting my rucksack on because it was so heavy and it was always wet and grimy and it smelled after a while. I just didn't want to put it on. I had this absolute mental block. I was like, I don't want to put that fucking thing on my back. Um, so I had to get over those sort of things. But I find the mental side of it far harder than the danger. Yeah, well, well let's talk about that aspect. And, and so here's another quote of yours on that exact topic. I would start the day positive and upbeat. And as each negative experience cropped up, I'd set myself the challenge of laughing at it and not allowing it to bring me down. Each time I succeeded, I'd give myself a pat on the back and it boosted my morale further to think that I was getting control over the way I reacted to external influences. So this positive psyche that you had to have day in, day out, something that was always part of your DNA or was it almost like a muscle you had to build over time? I, I definitely wouldn't present that expedition as me having mastered that at all. I mean, I, I, I was bad at it. I was trying, of course, um, I was, I, I, but I mean, I would descend into all sorts of childish frustration, sh- frustrations at probably what was, whatever was in front of me. You know, my initial walking partner, Luke, got the butt end of it initially, you know, we had a sort of tier system of guides in the end, as you know from reading the book. But, but you know, local guides, if we employed them and they didn't know the way to the next village, I could get so frustrated. It was almost like a cumulative frustration, you know, when you're abroad. And initially, it's all kind of cute, isn't it, that, that you get delayed and that people are messing you around. And then after a while, you become a bit a bit impatient and a bit a bit intolerant and 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 I, and I think that was cumulative expedition went on really um yeah well you me- you mentioned you actually became depressed at one point becoming pretty withdrawn and not talking to people and and even crying yourself to sleep at night so was it just the accumulation of all these things the the monotony the struggle uh was there a loneliness part of it like wh- what do you think eventually got to you I think I always knew it was going to be tough and I was always prepared to put my own pleasure on pause to do the expedition. So, you know, uh, it was a quite an animalistic thing. But, you know, as long as I was eating and and sleeping and, and moving forward in the day, I would literally ask myself, have you moved forward? And if the answer was yes, then the day was fine. You know, I didn't need to enjoy anything. Um, I did get enjoyment out of eating. I did get enjoyment out of washing in the rivers at night because that was just such a, a reset, a really cleansing, putting your head under the water after all the sort of grime and frustration but but you know it, 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 I think I made the whole expedition difficult you know I I didn't have the mindset uh, to be zen about whatever was happening I wasn't comfortable with uncertainty I was trying to control things and um, and that's exhausting you know and, and and so I definitely did get depressed as much as I say you know see si morimos morimos we die we die I was worried about you know the the life-threatening dangers which which appeared to be in front of us pretty much all the time and so I think it was it was in a stage of my life and I was early 30s, but I would say many people would have gone through this stage of their life, maybe earlier in life. I think I was quite immature up until quite a, an old age. And I think I was going through this stage of just evolving and learning. And I was trying to be there and I was trying to allow surrender to the flow of life, you know, um, be in the moment, all of that stuff. But but wasn't succeeding. I, I, I was still quite wrapped up in my head. I was still trying to control things. I was still frustrated if things didn't go my way. Um, so it was, it was a learning process. Well, so after thousands and thousands of miles, tens of thousands of mosquito bites and ant bites, and uh, about 860 days later, I believe, you finally came face to face with the Atlantic Ocean and you had your Guinness record, first person to ever hike the length of the Amazon. And 
Ed, I know it's been a number of years since that time, but do you recall the feeling you had when you sort of took that final step? Yeah, I, I'd been in a bad mood all morning, actually, um, and been frustrating and frustrated and moaning. And, and, and yet, when we did actually run down the beach and, and, and flop into the ocean, it was just so overwhelming. I was so happy. It was definitely, I mean, I, at the time I wasn't married and I didn't have kids, but up until that point, it was definitely the best day of my life. I'd, I'd expected it to be actually a little bit disappointing. I think I'd, I'd somehow thought it can't be as good as everything, but there was something about, it was combined. It was the relief of having got there. And there was a real relief, you know, it just, there was a real satisfaction having listened to so many people say it's impossible you're going to die it's impossible you're going to die it's impossible you're going to die it was a little bit of a two-fingered salute um or a, in america maybe a one-fingered salute um, yeah. <laughs> all of the all of those people who were all those people who were so negative and it, it was so frustrating me that everyone's default answer if they don't know about uh, you know nobody who i spoke to really knew about the jungle and yet they'd all say it's impossible. That's just because because it cause they cause it's never been done before. And, I, and that was red rag to a bull to me. And so that final day was was a real sort of <laughs> almost like a childish, I told you so. Well, I, I can tell, I mean, you're a pretty modest person, but the reality is if you put 10,000 people that all had the same quest off the starting line and pulled the trigger, it's very possible that only you would have been the one to cross that finish line. And not to say that there's something magical about you, but there is, I can tell, there was something inside you that really had to finish that quest. Despite what you went through, despite the depression, despite the uh, the near-death experiences, you you could have called it quits at any time, and you just kept going and going and going. So there is a certainly a, a resilience and tenacity inside of you that allowed you to get to that point. I'll acknowledge that I'm stubborn, yeah, but I don't think there's anything special about me. I think, weirdly, I do believe in certain things being or not being aligned with the the sort of universal plan. And we had loads of instances of good luck. Um, And I I don't really believe in luck. I kind of feel like luck is when you're aligned with the universe, things just happen. And, and, And it's almost magic. And it's almost like, wow, on earth did we get away with that? You know, arriving at with, I don't know, one example might be a 10-day trek through the jungle where often we're just using the sun to navigate. We're, we're check navigating with the GPS only at the end of the day. It's so broad-scale navigation. And yet we would hit a metre-wide path, not even obliquely, but the end of a metre-wide path that led down into the exact village that we were trying to get to. And like the, the chances of that are millions, if not billions to one. And then... Um, and yeah, I believe in the law of attraction. I believe in, in what you're holding in you is what you attract. And, you know, the energy you're giving from, from just interactions between people and the energy you're giving off to navigation, to, to, to huge goals, like trying to walk the length of the Amazon. For some reason, it felt like it was what I was meant to be doing at that time. And, and I think it, it wasn't because I was extraordinary. It was because I was aligned with the universe and therefore things were falling into place in an almost comical way to make it happen hmm. i know most people won't believe in that stuff but I, I i kind of i've just seen too many weird things happen again i'm not religious but if you buy into the whole gaia concept of the earth behaving and self-regulating itself by uh, like a living organism would you know we're just a little cog within that and if you align yourself with it then then things happen mm. yeah i believe a lot of what you're saying i can't necessarily point my finger at it but there is something spiritual that we can't understand that somehow influences the world in strange ways. I also believe that for, you know, for, this is a little bit odd, but uh, you know, for every amount of luck, there is an equal amount of unluck. So I would have been the one, like if I was with you on the trip, the tribesmen would have looked at you and said, okay, carry on your way. And then they would have looked at me and said, like, yeah, supper. <laughs> anyway, that's that's another, that's another story for another uh, episode. I should do my, my, my next expedition with you then, mate. <laughs> so, Ed, it uh, sounds like the experience really changed you afterwards in ways that you hadn't necessarily anticipated. So here's one more quote at you. I find myself in the pleasant position of being calmer and happier with the world about me. My confidence now comes from within rather than from the opinions of others. 
I now know who I am and what I am capable of. So it it seems like you really didn't need that outside validation after all, once this whole thing was said and done. I mean, none of us do, do we? I mean, I, I still am human and get caught up in the frustrating nonsense. This is, you know, um, external validation. And, and, and you know, I, I think it's so easy to slip back into. But yes, at the end of that expedition, I, I had got to a place where it was about my own inherent trust in myself um, rather than looking for the reactions in other people and but we all slip back into old habits you know we all slip back in I, I think all the time you know life for me is about you know remembering the lessons as well that you've learned back 10 years ago now and and, and going do, do you know what you've forgotten that you've forgotten that that was a really good idea to let go of doing that or or, or keep doing something else and and, and I think it, yeah life's a constant quest for me to be the best version of myself I, I, I sometimes really struggle with people who think that what's the right way of putting it I, um, I suppose bettering yourself is self-indulgent or is navel gazing or something like that and I just think you know I, I wouldn't want to carry on being an unaware or selfish or having these um, behavioral traits that aren't necessarily good for me I, got to try and work through those to be the best version of myself so that I suppose in a, in, invariably you, you work on yourself as an individual, don't you? So you can be a better person in your community, in your family, you know, better dad, better husband, all that sort of stuff. So I do think, and I think, I think weirdly adventure is a really good model for self-development. I really do. I think, you know, we live in such an easy world it's, and, and I think we become complacent and, and, and having adventures is weirdly stepping back into a far more visceral world. It's a far more vibrant world where potentially there's things that are life threatening. I mean, what in apart from crossing the road and getting hit by a bus, you know, not much is life threatening. And, and, you know, water comes out of a tap and, you know, food, there's a, pretty much always something in the fridge. And, and, I, and I think I think it's healthy, I've, especially for kids. I've become very involved in them. Um, in the scouts and, and other movements that help, that encourage kids to get outdoors. And I think that's such an important thing. And then they just get these little slices of life where they have to, they have to start thinking outside the box. They have, they're humbled because they don't have all the solutions and then they having to, they're having to learn, they're having to grow, they're having to become better versions of themselves. And I think that's, yeah, for me, that's super important. Well, so now that you're this uh, TV personality, do you enjoy that aspect of your life or is it just more of a means to an end so you can keep doing these fun, exciting adventure treks? Yeah, no, I think I do. I think, I think you'd be a bit daft if you put yourself on TV and, and, and didn't enjoy it when somebody recognizes you and comes up and asks for a selfie or something like that. I, th- I, I do enjoy it. It's a compliment. I think um, it, it came from an egoic place initially to, to try and be sort of famous and successful. But, uh, but I think having, having, re- achieved an element of success it it's just a reminder that you're on track i think and and that people are seeing good in the stuff that you do and that's that's a nice little pat on the back to get every now and again i I would temper that with the fact that nobody watches discovery channel in the uk so so i really don't get recognized very often it's a it's a satellite channel it gets it gets 1.6 percent of the viewership or something it gets it gets very small percent of the viewership so, um, yeah, I go to other countries and I'm quite well recognized, like Brazil and, uh, and, and Taiwan, bizarrely. Um, and yeah, in England, I can go to the pub and, and have a very normal life. So I'm quite lucky in that respect. Ed, the name of this podcast uh, is The Art of Excellence. When you think of the word excellence, what comes to mind? I'd like to think that I'm always trying to become the best version of myself. And I, I suppose best means excellence, doesn't it? And, and, and I think from this personal perspective i am quite hard on myself and and i do i do do pursue that i also have another factor that's coming into my life um that i hadn't kind of envisaged really which is being a dad now of three i've got a three-year-old and two two um six-month-old twin girls and i think part of me is recognizing that not everything needs to be excellent um i i just need to step back and enjoy what i've got as well now and and i think i uh, i think some people certainly i am one of those people can forever be on the hamster wheel pursuing excellence and actually you know 
what I've got is now pretty good and I'm I'm very, very grateful for what I have. And and I often think, do you know what? Just just step back from the pursuit, step back from getting I don't know whether it's a higher salary or another series on Discovery Channel or, or, or whatever it may be and just enjoy life now. Uh, and, and maybe that's a, a different form of excellence. Maybe that's excellence in terms of appreciation. Maybe that's excellence in terms of happiness and I suppose nurturing a family. I'm definitely becoming more family orientated and it's less about acquiring. Well, that's why I like the word excellence over, say, success, because you can sort of define it however you want. And the definition can evolve over time. And maybe that's what's happened to you. I, I do have one question. What is more challenging, hiking the length of the Amazon or raising two twin <laughs> six-month-old girls? <laughs> uh, the Amazon by far. No, I mean, it's, it's a boring answer, but they, we've just been so lucky. Um, they sleep through the night. They're happy. Touch wood, they're not allowed to go into a horrendous phase of, of <laughs> screaming and being a, being a nightmare but at the moment they're, they're good as gold well i have loved every second of this interview i don't think i'll be hiking the amazon but i can at least vicariously <laughs> partake in it for 60 minutes but uh ed honestly i i think uh i'm impressed obviously with with that track it's incredible but you're just a very humble a, a very self-aware person I, I really like you and I really enjoyed this and thanks for being so open and vulnerable and, uh, and sharing your story. Thank you, Glenn. I appreciate that. Mate. I really do. Uh, you said some really nice things. Absolute pleasure is the, uh, is the answer. And I've really enjoyed chatting to you as well. So thank you. Hey, thanks for listening. Okay. Don't go, don't go yet, please. Two favors. I ask simply two favors. One, if you could please download the iTunes app. You could do it on your phone. You can do it on the computer. Um, take 60 seconds and leave a review. It means a lot. Two, you can find my episodes on several social media sites, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter. Find the one that you like the most. Find the one where you tend to have a lot of friends and followers and if you could please either share it in the case of uh, Facebook and LinkedIn or retweet it uh, on Twitter, uh, that would mean the world to me. So those are the two asks I have. I love putting together this podcast. I hope you enjoy listening to it. Thank you so much, and I will see you again next time. Bye-bye.